Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In parts one through four of the Wars to Come series, we discussed why we believe the Kingsguard from the Tower of Joy are alive, living under the guises of Mance Raider, Corrin Halfhand, and Tormund Giantsbane, and who some of their unlikely allies are across the realm, including Wyman Manderley, Stannis Baratheon, Gior and Mage Mormont, Leighton Hightower, and Delirio Mopatis. We also discussed how Melisandre factors in, and that their overall mission is to prepare for the war to come with the ancient enemy of old, the Children of the Forest. We also introduced the idea that the children are responsible for acts of mass destruction against mankind, including the Doom of Valyria. In this video, we will be expanding on the concept that the leaders of the First Men, most of which are descended from Garth Greenhand, have been at war with the children since the dawn of days. And look to the histories, as in knowing what has already transpired will undoubtedly shed some light on many of the mysteries, myths, and motives surrounding the coming battle, starting with the earliest days of Westeros and Garth Greenhand. Some historians place the arrival of the first men to Westeros about 12,000 years ago, although some maesters dispute this. Upon coming to Westeros and leading the first men across what is now known as the Broken Arm of Dorne, Garth fathered many children, many who grew up to be heroes, kings, and great lords in their own right, founding mighty houses that endured for thousands of years. Of all these, the greatest was his firstborn, Garth the Gardener, who wore a crown of flowers and vines, and made his home atop the hill of the Mander that became known as High Garden. All of Garth Greenhand's other children did the Gardener homage as the rightful king of all men, everywhere. From his loins sprang House Gardener, whose kings ruled the reach beneath the banner of a green hand for many thousands of years, that is, until Aegon the Dragon and his sisters came to Westeros. Now, after Garth and the first men settled in, they immediately found themselves at war with the children. As the first men carved out holdfasts and farms, they cut down the faces they found in the weirwoods and gave them to the fire. Horror struck, the children went to war. The old songs say that the green seers used dark magics to make the seas rise and sweep away the land, shattering the arm. But it was too late to close the door. The wars went on until the earth ran red with blood of men and children both, but more children than men. For men were bigger and stronger, and wood and stone and obsidian make a poor match for bronze. Finally, the wisest of both races prevailed, and the chiefs and heroes of the first men met the green seers and wood dancers amidst the weirwood groves on a small island in the great lake called the God's Eye. There they forged the pact. The pact began 4,000 years of friendship between men and children. In time, the first men even put aside the gods they had brought with them and took up the worship of the secret gods of the wood. The most interesting part of this passage is that the first men gave the carved faces of the weirwoods to the fires. In A Song of Ice and Fire, the burning or offering of religious artifacts and icons is something that we see practiced by Melisandre, when she has Stannis offer the Idols of the Seven to the flames, as well as burning the Weirwood and the Godswood at Storm's End as offerings to the Lord of Light. The other important fact is that when the first men came to Westeros, they did so with gods of their own. During the Dawn Age, Many of the more primitive peoples of the earth worshipped a fertility god or goddess, and it is said that Garth Greenhand had much and more in common with these deities. It was Garth who first gave men the gift of seed, and showed them how to plant and sow, how to raise crops and reap the harvest. Based on this, it is our belief that the original god or gods of the first men was some version of what is today called the Lord of Light, in the sense that they worshipped life and what was needed to sustain it. So let's get this started with R'hllor, 
also known as the Red God and the Lord of Light. R'hllor is primarily worshipped in the East. The Red Priests of R'hllor are numerous in the Free Cities, and R'hllor's worship is often associated with light and fire. In Volantis stands the greatest Red Temple in all the world, where children are bought as slaves and trained to become the temple's warriors, prostitutes, and priests. The prostitutes, as maesters call them, are what we are going to concentrate on here. In the Summer Isles, fertility gods and goddesses are worshipped, and in our opinion are the very same gods worshipped by Garth Greenhand and the First Men. So in faiths such as R'hllor and those practiced in the Summer Isles, those who would be considered prostitutes in places such as Westeros are actually held in high esteem and regarded as priestesses. For in both of these religions, the union of male and female is considered a sacred act that honors the gods and goddesses from which they came. Garth Greenhand was by all accounts a very magical man. Everywhere he went, life of all kinds flourished. As the maesters say, he had more in common with fertility gods than he ever did with common men. So if Garth Greenhand is associated with life, then he seems to represent, in some ways, what Melisandre considers to be the Lord of Light. Melisandre defines R'hllor as a god of light, warmth, and life, in never-ending conflict with the Great Other, who represents cold, darkness, and death. The way the world is made, the truth is all around you, plain to behold. The night is dark and full of terrors, the day bright and beautiful and full of hope. One is black, the other white. There is ice and there is fire, hate and love, bitter and sweet, male and female, pain and pleasure, winter and summer, evil and good, death and life. Everywhere opposites, everywhere the war. As all of us familiar with the story know, the Red Priesthood has taken a keen interest in the war to come. When taking Melisandre's words into account, it seems logical because this war is what their entire religion is based on. Being a religion that essentially worships life and the tools that sustain it, it seems logical to assume that the fire-worshipping customs originated during the original Long Night where fire became the most important life-sustaining tool that humanity had. Fire was, after all, the only light they had. It was a means of killing their enemies, and it was the only reason they did not all freeze to death. This being the case, it seems likely that during the first long night, this faction broke off from the worshipping of fertility or life and concentrated on fire. Garth Gardner, who was Garth Greenhand's firstborn son, was considered the rightful king of all men, everywhere, which perfectly parallels a statement made by Selyse in A Dance with Dragons, John 10. To R'hllor, the Lord of Light, may he defend us all, one land, one god, one king. It seems to us that Garth Greenhand was determined to not only populate Westeros, but provide mankind with knowledge of agriculture, making it possible for specialization in trades to exist, thereby creating communities where the people would be interdependent. In such communities, farmers raise livestock and crops, smiths make tools and shoes for horses, thatchers make roofs for homes, and so on and so forth. This served to unify mankind, many of which were of his bloodline. So if and or when the time came for man to fight the great other, they would be ready, able, and willing to make common cause against their common enemy. Nowhere is this more important than in the North, where the winters are the harshest and strong community bonds are vitally important to survival. Places such as the Glass Gardens of Winterfell make it possible for House Stark, as well as everyone at Winterfell and the Wintertown outside its walls, to survive such winters, 
but only through cooperation, none of which would be possible without the gift of agriculture bestowed on mankind by House Stark's ancestor, Garth Greenhand. Although the Starks seem to keep to some of the ways passed down by Garth, they remain isolated in the North. Not only does Moat Kalen form a barrier from a military standpoint, but also leaves the North geographically isolated, thereby making House Stark one of the only houses in Westeros that keeps to the old gods, maintains ancient customs of the First Men, and intermarried only with those of true First Men blood. This all changed when Rickard Stark befriended John Aaron, Stephen Baratheon, and Hoster Tully in the War of the Nine Penny Kings. Had it not been for these friendships and the alliances created as a result of them, House Stark could very well have been gone before the books even began. By infiltrating the thoughts and dreams of men, the children could very well be the cause of the actions taken by Rhaegar, which led to the deaths of Brandon and Rickard. And without the support of the Vale, the Stormlands, and the Tullys, Ned and Benjen would have died, in turn ending the line of House Stark. So, why would the children of the forest want to eliminate the Starks, the only great house in Westeros that has continued honoring the old gods, as was promised by the first men in the pact? Well, we believe it could have something to do with their blood, the blood of Winterfell. As previously mentioned, the Starks are one of the only families in Westeros who have not intermarried with those of Andal blood, making them not only descendants of Garth Greenhand, but descendants of Garth Greenhand of pure First Men blood. Given that Garth is likened to a fertility god in the histories, known for his ability to make life of all kinds flourish everywhere he went, it seems that he may have possessed some sort of magic. This leads us to believe that those who have Garth Greenhand's blood would likely inherit some of his abilities. The Starks, given their pure First Men blood, likely possess the purest Garth Greenhand blood of any family still in existence, in turn making the Starks the most direct descendants of Garth Greenhand in the world. So, if there is power in Garth Greenhand's blood, and he was considered not only the High King of the First Men, but of all men everywhere, isn't this starting to remind you of a very common phrase used throughout the story? There is power in King's blood. But how can Garth Greenhand's blood be the King's blood referred to in the story? Pretty much everyone, everywhere, believes that the King's blood is that of Valyrian blood, or Targaryen blood. And so did we, until we discovered two passages that brought clarity to one of the biggest mysteries in the books. At the Wall, there is a lot of talk about King's blood. John, who doesn't understand what it is, sends Maester Aemon and Mance's baby away because he fears for their lives. Aemon being a Targaryen and Mance being the king beyond the wall. Now, Mance is Arthur Dane, which means he is clearly of first men descent. And Maester Aemon's mother was also a Dane, which means he's of first men descent as well. Based on the geographic location of Starfall in comparison to the Reach, Coupled with the fact that the Danes were kings in their own right for thousands of years, it seems almost impossible that they never married into any of the great houses of the Reach, who were also kings at the time, and descendants of Garth Greenhand. When John is talking to Sam about Mel needing king's blood to wake a stone dragon, and that Mance's blood is no more royal than his own, he's right. But their blood is a lot more royal than he thinks. As a Stark and a Dane, John is pure First Men blood, and the blood of Garth Greenhand. As mentioned, there are two key passages which led us to the conclusion that King's blood is in fact the blood of Garth Greenhand. In A Storm of Swords, Davos V, Melisandre is trying to convince Stannis to sacrifice Edric Storm to the fires, which Davos is adamantly against. I am a small man, Davos admitted. So tell me why you need this boy, Edric Storm, to wake your great stone dragon, my lady. He was determined to say the boy's name as often as he could. Only death can pay for life, my lord, 
A great gift requires a great sacrifice. Where's the greatness in a base-born child? He has king's blood in his veins. You have seen what even a little of that blood could do. I saw you burn some leeches. And two false kings are dead. So, I bet a lot of you are wondering what was so special about that conversation. Well, Melisandre said that Edric Storm had king's blood, as in plural, not king's blood as in having one king's blood. Edric Storm is the son of Robert Baratheon and Delena Florent, conceived on Stannis' wedding night. Delena is Stannis' wife's cousin. That means he has Garth Greenhand's blood from both parents, therefore explaining why she said King's blood instead of King's blood, because the Florents are descendants of Garth, and the Baratheons are as well. The other passage that lends credence to the idea that King's blood is really referring to Garth Greenhand's blood occurs in A Storm of Swords, Davos III, where Melisandre suggests making a shadow baby with Davos. Is the brave Sir Onion so frightened of a passing shadow? Take heart, then. Shadows only live when given birth by light, and the king's fires burn so low I dare not draw off any more to make another son. It might well kill him. With another man, though. A man whose flames still burn hot and high. If you truly wish to serve your king's cause, come to my chamber one night. I could give you pleasure such as you have never known, and with your life fire I could make." Now, Melisandre continuously tells us, and everyone else that will listen to her, that her blood magic requires king's blood. As far as I know, there are no references to Davos having any Valyrian or Targaryen blood. But what is possible, given the fact that the legends of Garth Greenhand indicate that lords and common folk alike were known for giving him their virgin daughters so he might bless them with a bountiful harvest. Davos could very well have a touch of Greenhand blood in him. So, when looking at the fact that Melisandre wanted to use Davos's life fire to make a shadow baby, coupled with the fact that she cited Edric Storm's king's blood, plural, as the reason that she wanted to sacrifice him to the fires, and add to that the fact that Garth Greenhand appears to have had some serious magical abilities. This leads us to believe that King's blood is in fact the blood of Garth Greenhand, the High King of the First Men, and the rightful King of all men, everywhere. The world has known ice in the long night, and it has known fire in the doom. But the past is already written, the ink is dry. The realm has seen bountiful harvests, battles of all kind, and survived the darkest of times, times when children were born and lived their lives in darkness, in winter. But that's a tale for another time. Speaking of tales, coming up in our next video, we're going to be discussing Old Nan and revealing who we think she really is. So stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand.